2017 Speed Chess Championship. With me here is uh, International Master Ramon Hamilton, known for his beard, known for his chess bra channel, and uh, and we're going to have the call here for the next couple hours. So don't go anywhere. These are the two two highest rated on average players we've had so far. Uh, but if you're wondering what's at stake, fifty thousand dollars in total prize money and pretty much the pride of winning, winning and making your way through a and. Wesley So going at it. So, all right, back to the chess, Amon. We see a little bit of a repeat, not quite the same theory, but almost the same line we saw last game that Wesley won is white, right? Yeah, um, and one thing, Danny, as much as people may or may not uh, divulge information as to whether they prepared for a match, um, I feel like everyone does some type of preparation, especially at a, the highest level that they're playing at, which is mm -hmm. they may decide on a certain system or a certain opening that they want to use to some effect throughout the match. and. It seems like Giri faced with d4 has been going with knight f6, potentially open to the Nimzo and Queen's Indian and stuff like that, uh, or the Catalan structures. And then uh, after knight f3, he's been going d5 the last couple of games. So it seems like he's open to these Queen's Gambit positions. Wesley himself was playing them with black for the last couple of games as well. So with d4, it seems to be Queen's Gambit. And we see Wesley, ever since that first game, Danny, he hasn't played e4. He, he hasn't gone back into that Sicilian because he probably admitted that that did not go well for him. So mm -hmm. he's adjusting mid-match uh, to his strategy, and that's it, that's always very impressive and very hard to do. Um, and so yeah, no, I, I wanted to say that. It's really important to do because you we, you and I have also seen times in these blitz matches where someone sort of takes that approach, as you said. They have sort of a line they've prepared, something they want to commit to, and it doesn't go well, and then they refuse to switch. Right, it doesn't go well, but they're stubborn. They they refuse to switch, and then you know we see that add up. And and uh, I think the one game so far that Geary has outplayed Wesley was that first game in the Sicilian. Since then, um, you know they drew the second game, but it, it seems to be Wesley So's match so far. Yeah, no, you got to be uh, you got to be able to adapt. And you know with the tilt, it starts to kick in when you get a bad position and you keep repeating it. Um, like you said, being very stubborn, that's not a good right. quality to have in a, a long match like this where, you know, how many games are they going to play with white and black, Danny? It's more than a world championship, right? They're going to, they're going to play, uh, they'll probably play about 15 of each total, right? I mean, 15 yeah. with white, 15 with black and you sometimes to, yes. more. So um, yeah, you, you got to be willing to adapt and, and also, you know, figure out, you know, figure out if there are chances for improvements. I think that, um... It's always an interesting thing to hear afterwards, too, when we ask the players what their thoughts were heading in, if, if they tried something that they had prepared or not. Yeah. But okay, so this game, the one thing I see in this game that Geary's doing differently, he's playing a little faster. Uh, I think White still has a small edge here in this position, uh, but, but Geary so far has been up on time. Yep. Um, he's probably going to have to play the move F5 pretty soon, uh, if you know, just to deal with queen d3, unless he yep. goes to this move, bishop f4, where he does leave the option open to play g6. And the move previous, of course, bishop takes h6 was in the position. So he's doing this maybe to allow for g6 to deal with queen d3, because you wouldn't really like to play f5 if, if you could avoid that one. Um, but the, the other thing is that it's basically the attack and the initiative of white against the structural superiority of black, because you, you trade some pieces off here, Danny, all of a sudden, Rook d8, rook c8, maybe bishop a6 in some lines with the pawn gets to c4. Black yep. can build up quite some pressure against those pawns. And that's a great point, Amon. Yeah, obviously right now everyone sees that there was a checkmate threat here, everybody. That's why black had to play g6, of course, because that would be a bad thing to miss. But as Amon said, I mean, if black holds the position, the long-term structure, and, and it's a sustainable position because you have the c-file, this is not a very good pawn when it's open like that. Um, and, and Wesley has this attack, but... But now he's down a pawn, and notice uh, Anish kind of, you know, like a thief in the night. Look at that, right? He just grabbed the pawn and then went right back and said, well, a pawn's a pawn. Yeah. We'll see if he lives to tell the story, because now Wesley's going to bring this rook over and look for this one to be a, a wild affair. White is all in for the attack, everybody. Uh, but if black holds, he's not only up a pawn already, but as Amon said, probably positionally better anyway. Um, I kind of like Geary's chances, honestly. I like that he grabbed that pawn. Uh, I think that in the match situation as well, you got to make Wesley prove it at this point. He just played right. a game where he sort of came at Geary in the opening a little bit, and that probably took him by surprise. Now, you know, he can't just let him get away with hanging a pawn on h2 and, and not taking it. Um, I'm a bit critical. I thought Wesley could have maybe, you know, played g3 or played h3, which is one of those moves to keep the pawn and get a very similar yeah. kind of position, maybe minus a couple tempi, but he's really going for it here. 
and I think he, he's committing a lot for what probably wasn't entirely necessary. Although, he is going to play, you know, Rook E3, Rook H3, Rook G3, and build up some serious uh, threats. So I imagine we'll see Rook E3 here. I think that's what he wants to do. Um, yeah, the Rook coming to E3 does two things. Of course, it guards the C-pawn and prepares to shift over, and that's exactly what we've seen. But but I, I agree with you. I think that pawn that pawn was a... Uh, was a healthy pawn, and and now now Geary gets to be aggressive and say, well, I if I defend, I I, I have very good chances. I probably win this game. Yep. Watch out for threats on h6 now, as the queen and rook are sort of eyeing this pawn together. Everybody, um, is Geary going to go with with g5 or f4? Yeah. Every time you push one of those pawns, it opens up this bishop on c2, though. So you got to be careful about that. Yeah, g5 feels a lot safer. F4, queen d3 already looks a little a little weird. Um, yeah. At first, y you might have rook f6 there, but but I agree. I think it looks looks like g5 is is a little safer. Yeah. Um, now g5 can definitely be played here. Um, the e5 square is permanently white, but the one thing that that happens sometimes when you lift your rooks for an attack, Danny, is that they get stuck out there. You play g5, yeah. suddenly those rooks they they have no yep. formation. You play rook h4 to h3, and then they're just bumping into each other. They can't double. Yep. Uh, and sometimes it gets really weird when you uh, play g5 and the rooks look like that. So maybe g5, the rook moves, black can play something like queen f4, inviting a move like g3, and then suddenly maybe there's like a bishop c6, uh, and you start to punish white's diagonal. So I like uh, Giri's chances here with g5, maybe a rook on f6 for defense, and yep. that's a healthy pawn to me. I agree. I, I agree with... I agree with everything you just said. Look how on the same page we are. Yeah, the G5 uh -oh. is coming, and uh, look at that. Do we agree very often? Oh, Danny, we, we besides, hardly agree. It's very nice to see. Besides on your hairstyle, we all agree on that. But other than that, I mean, I don't know that we agree every day. So No, but seriously, I agree. And it's a great point about the rooks getting themselves in trouble, something for everyone to always remember, that it feels good when you put the rook on the elevator, and I'm going to go checkmate on the open file, but... If it's not forced, the rooks aren't made to operate there in front of a structure because of things like that. So the, the biggest surprise I have now, Amon, what's the deal with the time? Gary has gone into a minute-plus think tank, which, unless you're delivering some sort of concrete blow, is always really surprising to me when they take that that kind of time. So what, what's he what's he thinking about? I, I think he was, uh, you know, maybe just giving a bit of respect or overestimating some of Wesley's uh, tactics because, you know, when you're playing a 2800 player and, and you just sacks a pawn out of the blue, you do have to, to give some respect to that. He, he's gone with this G5 Rook F6 plan, which I do like. It is, it is a bit passive, but in any endgame, White's not getting rid of the fact that C3 is weak. The only yep. thing is that, Danny, at the, the, the end of the day, this is a blitz game, and that bishop on D7 is uh, a bad bishop, and White might now swing the Rook on H3 over to E3 and just try to play... A regular position down upon. But but on that point, as you said, it is a blitz game, and that's why I was sort of critical about his time management. I mean, obviously, yeah, I agree. We have to respect our opponent's threats, but um, I think that, you know, if this becomes a time scramble, you, you always have to think back at those moments where how and why you managed the time the way you did, and uh, now Wesley has gone from almost being a minute up to a, uh, sorry, a minute down to a minute up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but Wesley has given up on the on the attack, so this G5 plan in Rook F6 kind of put the kibosh on the king side threats. But but Wesley, like any good player does, he's not stubborn with his plan. He quickly switches to the plan you said of maybe now I just focus on this weak E6 pawn, brings the bishop to B3 to do it. Yeah. Uh, so okay. Wesley is he's going to bring that rook back to E1, Danny, and now F4 is another thing committed. He can or or F3, I, but here comes F3, and if if now if we can open up the position. White's king may be the one in a mating net. I don't see how that queen is getting over there, though, uh, Danny. It's very optimistic. He he might, you know, really go for it with something like queen e7, queen f8, trying to get over there. But there's ideas like bishop c2 and rook takes g5 would be a, a pretty big threat. Bishop c2, queen d3, and just going to h7 also looks very good. But it looks like he's kind of gone for it here with sacking temporarily the e6 pawn, and he's trying to play queen e8, queen f7, and get the queen h5. Yeah, and it's interesting enough to go for. I mean, you've got you've got uh, you got real real threats. I mean, if you get the queen into h five, everybody, you're about a hop, skip, and a jump away from checkmate. So this is that's why Wesley decides to remove the king from being checked. Um, now what is is uh, is Black continuing with this plan of queen h five, or happy with the fact that it's a threat and decides not to execute just yet? 
Um, well, I, the thing is, it doesn't become a threat until you actually get the queen there, because you still have to go to right. eight three after that. So right. I, I feel like that's kind of principled. But the thing is that he's got queen f1 at all times. That's his point of putting the queen on d3 to, to meet yep. queen h3, queen f1. And then suddenly you have to make sure that the rest of your position doesn't just fall apart in the meantime. Like yep. the b5 pawn and e6 pawn so weak, you really have to be careful about going into an endgame here. Look at the time advantage that this is... Uh, the first real test of Geary very low on time compared to his opponent that we're going to see. Yeah, I agree. And again, it makes me keep coming back to that moment where we, we question Geary's time management uh, in that earlier position. But but okay, I mean, the two-second increment, that is the time control. It's five minutes plus a two-second increment. Always makes uh, makes us surprised by the, the high-quality level of chess that these players are able to maintain under time pressure. So I don't really expect Geary to blunder just yet. Um, he is, I think, still a little better. Right. In the position. Um, one thing, Danny, is that I can't be critical of him yet because I have yet to see how he performs in a time scramble. You know, I, I can't, I can't say that it's a bad idea because he might prove to just be very, very good uh, in a time scramble, and then yep. I can't be as critical of him getting low on time. But of course, for everybody, it's something you generally want to avoid. Um, yep. I like the fact that he has the outside pass pawn here, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he, if he's been going for a slightly better position here. Well, Wesley defended enough to gobble up that F3 pawn over that last series of exchanges, but with the smoke clearing, Black is probably... Actually, I don't know. I mean, now... now oh, I didn't see that coming. With rookie one and the transition over to the king side is on, but what's yeah, the idea? Ah, if it's he takes out. H6, we have to show that, right? If, if White had taken H6, yep. we would have a mating net here, everybody. And uh, that would have been nasty stuff for White to be dealing with. Um, I, I wonder if he's going to go for the draw here. Um, without a lot of time, he just might, yeah. and looks like he is. 